I'm uh, Gillen Wood. I'm the Associate Director for the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment. And we'd like to, to begin today by recognizing that we're on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Pinakashua, Wea, Miami, Mascouten, Modara, Salk, Muskaki, Kikapu, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. And these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward. Now, uh, an important announcement about this workshop today on corporate responsibility, this is appropriately enough a green certified event. Now, today we'll be talking about sustainability and it's so important that we walk the walk as well. We've prioritized environmentally conscious planning in creating this event, hence our green certification. And more information on green certification is available um, uh, for your reference on the IC website. So welcome to the second in our series of environmental leadership workshops this spring. This is the corporate sustainability workshop. Now, what is the goal of the workshop today? It's to provide an overview of corporate sustainability as an ideal, as a developing industry standard, and as a practical set of marketable skills and aspirations for college graduates such as yourselves entering the job market. So the afternoon sessions, looking ahead, offers you the uh, experience of a condensed career fair, as well as a networking opportunity that would typically happen the night before a career fair. This morning's program, meanwhile, uh, focuses on input from experts and career professionals in the field of corporate sustainability. So learn as much as you can from them and put it all into practice this afternoon. So as I mentioned, today's workshop is part of a greater uh, program we're developing at the Institute called the Environmental Leadership Program. And we plan to launch that as a full-fledged program next year. Now we'll be giving you a survey at the end of the workshop for vital feedback. You're participating in the survey at the end of the workshop will be invaluable to our offering the best possible training experience in environmental leadership next year. So what is the environmental leadership program? This program is, a, is unique uh, and offered to a multidisciplinary group of undergraduate students interested in gaining pre-professional experience in environmental sustainability. The program focuses on firstly, the development of important practical skills that will better equip students for the job market. Secondly, to improve students' understanding of current environmental issues and approaches to solving them with a focus on the nexus between research policy, industry, advocacy, and government. But in the end, of course, it's all about preserving a livable planet for ourselves and for those that come after us. It's about converting hearts and minds to the cause of sustainability, creating behavior change in our communities and dedicating our life and work to clean air, clean water, sustainable food and a just clean energy future. We hope today will be one starting point for you on that life journey. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the Corporate Sustainability Workshop today, Dr. Harriet Henches. Dr. Harriet Henches is president and CEO of Henches Associates, and advisor to business and nonprofit organizations to accelerate sustainability responsibility in the, in the retail consumer goods and tourism industries. Dr. Henches was the first in the sustainability team at Walmart, and she crafted and directed the sustainability strategy for a Hold USA. She has served on the Food Marketing Institute Sustainability Executive Committee, a collaboration of sustainability leaders of some 25 US grocery chains. She also held an executive position at Sears World Trade and was a partner in Hench's Kahn and Strauss, an advisory firm to food and agribusinesses in agribusiness industries aimed at fostering a sustainable food system from soil to shelf. Her government service includes the US Special Trade Representative's Office and the US State Department. She is currently a partner in the Sustainable Tourism Group, an investment firm developing sustainable tourism projects in Rwanda and other East African countries. She is also an independent director of Biotech Global, 
biotech, high tech, bio high tech global, I should say, a NASDAQ traded high tech solutions company for food waste. And in the midst of it all, she is also serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. Now, they say that if you've got something need to be done, give it to a busy person. And this is certainly a case in point. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Harriet Henches here to, um, to deliver this morning's keynote address to you. Uh, her title is uh, Sustainability in the Private Sector. And please join me virtually in welcoming Dr. Harriet Henches. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Wood. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm a graduate by affiliation. My husband is an enthusiastic graduate of the University of Illinois. So um, what goes on there is uh, familiar to me and uh, I found the creation of the Institute most exciting and followed some of the things that it has done. So you're in good hands in pursuing uh, an education with that in mind. <clears throat> Never has it been more critical, opportune, or exciting to consider the role of the private sector in sustainability. The social and environmental challenges are enormous, and the world needs the private sector with its unique assets to help address those challenges. <clears throat> I want to consider three things today. Is it in the interest of business to be a change maker in sustainability? Is its response equal to its impacts? And what are the best practices? And thirdly, how do you think about and prepare for a career in the field? The private sector is a big tent. It includes banks, venture capital firms, early stage startups, uh, small and medium sized businesses, Fortune 100, Fortune 500, individual investors, companies traded on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, as well as asset managers and institutional investors. All are oriented to profits, not to discount their generosity to uh, good causes. This graphic is uh, that you see on the screen is, uh, I think you see on the screen, Yulia, can you advance the slide? There. You're all familiar with this uh, triple bottom line. It was coined <clears throat> to show the um, progression and the evolution of sustainability. Think of these as interests, interest groups. And up to the point that sustainability began to emerge, these were not overlapping. Academics and government and nonprofits took care of people and the planet and business for the most part was out of it. So part of the evolution of the field was to be able to um, see the intersection and overlapping interests in this. Um, typically, business has a laser focus on efficiency, productivity, cutting costs, and improving the bottom line in order to satisfy investors and uh, secure more capital. So business asks, what does that have to do with sustainability and what does it have to do with me? Evidently a lot as corporate leaders in sustainability have discovered. Motivation to invest in sustainability has changed from compliance and risk management to seeing it as a way to enhance one's reputation. Only recently has it come to be seen that it can help the bottom line. Next slide. Uh, we define sustainability as actions that support the quality of life now and for generations to come. So it was a new thought that would actually be good for business and it had to be proven by the many, many people who got their toe in the water. Green Biz, the premier media and events company in this space said in its annual state of the green business, <coughs> excuse me, report, that for many of the world's largest corporations, sustainability is now seen as key to minimizing risks, increasing resilience, enhancing competitiveness and unlocking new opportunities through innovations. Walmart is a case in point. Its entry into being a player did not come from a conviction that sustainability would have a positive impact on the bottom line. Quite the contrary, they're worried about it. Um, 
And they didn't realize that the committing to zero waste would spawn all sorts of innovations and cut costs and make them a more efficient business. Its pressure was from their consumers and nonprofits. The NGOs pressed them to address their social and environmental impacts, which they hardly knew. It was at the time I joined them, the bet noir among businesses. And it, it was um, uh, among my friends and colleagues, they were puzzled at or critical of the move. Uh, with the help of a number of leading environmental organizations, Walmart uh, set, uh, looked at their impacts, analyzed it, created a strategy to set relevant and ambitious goals and brought employees and suppliers along. While reluctant initially, a few years into it, the CEO of Walmart said in a public meeting, this is a no brainer. We used to bring in all this cardboard and paid somebody to take it away. Now we bring less in and someone pays us to take it away. In the book, Green Giants by Freya Williams, she identifies $10 billion companies that turned a strategy of sustainability and social good into a billion dollar proposition, business proposition. We'll consider two of these later. Um, next slide. Um, this is what the change, how the change came about. The pandemic didn't slow the pace. And Joel McCower, the founder and editor of Green Biz said, all told, it's an encouraging story at a dis disappearing, dispiriting time. The march of progress in sustainable business continues inexorably as the leading edge continues to push forward. During 2020, for example, the notion of net zero climate and other commitments accelerated to the point where yet another zero, announce, zero announcement was a non-story to those of us in the news business. So while business changed the trajectory of sustainability, business was changed by it as well. Integrating the ESG goals into business strategy proved to be a critical driver of long-term success. Why business? Next slide. Um, let me uh, go back to the last slide, the business driver. Um, these are the um, uh, gold uh, ring, the brass ring that business reaches for growth and return on investment, brand value and reputation, attracting and retaining customers and employees. So um, once they began to see the demonstration of this, then they were on board. And the more that got on board, the more others saw what was happening and got on board. So we can go to the next slide. Business is a natural. It has the scale, the capital, and the expertise and the self-interest. It has the scale, they're global in, in their reach or even within their country. Um, they have many options for getting the capital to invest in this. And they have the expertise relevant to all these uh, problems and challenges that have come up. Um, and they've invested a great deal of money in their employees. But, but the knowledge of those employees and their perceptions was invaluable to moving sustainability forward. They obviously have the self-interest because of the profits that it bring, brought, but also because of what it was, um, how it changed their business. Um, all of these were evident in the Walmart's case, but not Walmart alone. Um, in, to, in 2020, $17 trillion was invested in um, sustainable assets. This was a growth of 42% over a two year period. Yet that is only 33% of the 51 trillion in total US assets under professional management. While business in, is investing in what's possible, replicable, pathbreaking, profitable, much more is possible. Initially environmental investment largely focused on climate crisis and greenhouse gas emissions. And we're beginning to see examples of actions with both carrots and sticks in a new area of biodiversity. To demonstrate this, the investment arm of Northern European's largest financial services group, 
Nordea Asset Management, wielded its considerable stick uh, to uh, um, excuse me, press for these <clears throat> advancements in uh, biodiversity. Um, for this reason, recently they dropped the Brazilian meat giant, JBS, from its $280 million portfolio. It said the reason this they did this was tied to its environmental goals. JBS links to farms involved in Amazon deforestation were inconsistent with those goals. The exclusion of JBS is quite dramatic because it's, this decision was done from all of its funds, not just ones that were labeled ESG. Um, this will deprive JSB of an important source of capital and by implication, divert more capital to those who have proposals and projects in and have biodiversity criteria. An ESG advisory service says that their member institutional investors uh, have 7 trillion in equity assets and consider biodiversity to some extent. They, along with global S&P ratings and Bloomberg ranked biodiversity among the top ESG themes for 2021. While this is all good, you have to look at relative to how much is invested in global assets. Um, there are 100 trillion a year, so 7 trillion is very little. Most investors still don't put a price tag on natural capital, land, water, air, oceans, and, and animal and plant life, or the cost of losing it. Again, according to GreenBiz, the pandemic fo focused investors on the vulnerability and resilience of the financial system. The pandemic illustrated in such a brutal way what can happen when we jackboot into nature's territory. This could make habitat destruction and biodiversity loss especially relevant for investors going forward. What business is doing to mitigate its negative impacts are as varied as the businesses themselves from transportation, steel, agriculture, even to making their sports shoes. They demonstrate in concrete terms how the commitment to sustainability is becoming broader and on the topics are becoming broader than we originally thought possible. I'm gonna focus on the examples that I give here, uh, mainly on the environmental, but um, the social impact of corporations, both their negative and uh, what they could be doing positively is important, is, is a very important topic. And there are no silos in, in sustainability because everything affects everything else. You have to look at all as a system. U.S. Steel's goal was to reduce its emissions intensity by 20% by 2030. It was, this was based on a 2018 baseline. It's a modest target, and yet it was considered significant because they recognize the need to make progress as steel is one of the most emission intensive sectors. Tech giant Apple is striving for carbon neutrality as well um, uh, through its supply chain. Um, it, I'm having trouble with my computer. Uh, its way of uh, reaching for carbon neutrality was to uh, announce an uh, investment in a project to protect and restore 27,000 acres of mangrove forest on the Colombia's Caribbean coast. According to its partner, Conservation International, these mangroves and coastal wetlands can store up to 10 times more carbon per unit area than terrestrial forests. Apple will then purchase the carbon credits generated from this project by providing, that provides a new income stream for 12,000 local people whose livelihoods depend on the mangroves. Another topic of interest was attracting and retaining employees. This remains a, a solid byproduct of overarching corporate sustainability goals. This has led to supporting a number of so sustainable mobility initiatives including incentives and perks for employees. 
over the past few years, the company Gentech has uh, built out an electric computer shuttle program for its employees, uh, such as in, in uh, uh, easy access to carpooling and um, uh, I'm sorry, my computer went by. Um, so what it did was do a lot of innovation in, in mobility. Um, Apple echoed that since they have, young, uh, most of their employees are under 25 and social sustainable mobility is important to them. Um, they are investing in it as well. Mars is a pet and food company and is a founding member of Renewable Thermal Collaborative, working to pull together companies to accelerate cost-effective renewable technology, spearheading bio principles work and working groups doing research, all with the goal of scaling solutions faster to achieve all fossil free energy by 2040. No easy feat for a company in the low margin of business pet food. Mars has an agricultural supply chain, which is vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. As a result, many of its suppliers who farm a wide variety of cocoa and coffee uh, may go out of business if their farms are in, impacted by floods um, and droughts or other climate induced impacts. It along with Danone, the French yogurt maker uh, and Unilever and others, they formed the Sustainable Food Policy Alliance, which among other things, press for the development of agricultural carbon markets. The head of the advocacy organization, Climate Voice commented, I think they see the long-term threat to their business. And rather than waiting for the problems and then adapting to them, they want to see action taken now. Dow Chemical is considering how to assess natural capital and how it affects their business decisions. They're doing this with the Nature Conservancy. And all the scientists, engineers, and economists from both organizations have worked to, re to create the tools to assess the, the services that nature provides to Dow's operations. The fashion industry has come to recognize its impact on the, uh, they and their supply chains have on water, waste and harmful chemicals. So the manufacturers, designers and retailers and their supply chains are collaborating to do the necessary sharing and innovating to reduce the footprint of the industry. Patagonia wants you to wear the jacket you buy from them longer, so they will repair the zipper if it breaks to encourage you not to add it to the tons of garments that landfills receive every year. Nike worried about all the waste resulting from how they made their shoes. So they gathered up all the waste on the factory floor and created a trash shoe. You may be familiar with it. It suggested to the star NBA player, Steve Nash, known for his environmental awareness, that it be named for him. His initial reaction was no way until he saw the environmental benefits. It became a popular selling shoe and many other followed suit. Nike went further and created the fly knit shoe, which is woven rather than piece cut and pieced together, avoiding all that waste on the, uh, on the factory floor. This reduced 80% of the waste of the conventional athletic shoe during manufacturing. Next slide. Um, you, can, uh, you can go back one. Julia. So who is doing it well? Well, there are many that are. Uh, Walmart, GE and Unilever are standouts. And I'll give you an example of why. Um, Next slide. Unilever is an, was one of the iconic plastic uh, leaders in a very broad and comprehensive sustainability strategy. They created something called the Sustainable Living Plan, which reached to all of their 190 countries and uh, all their brands, and they have about 142 projects 
uh, products. The amazing thing that they did was decoupling economic growth from carbon growth. Many times companies who, when people were tracking their carbon growth, they would say, but our sales grew. And so what Unilever says, we're not going to link those together. We're going to set our economic growth plans and our carbon reduction plans, and they will be quite separate. So they had to be extremely innovative to do this. It was comprehensive and it had ambitious, goal, ambitious goals. Proof that there was no greenwashing is they had third party verification of claims of progress. So when Unilever set its, its goals, it knew that it was going to track them and it had to make progress towards the end date of those goals. Um, they also did a robust, robust communication of sustainable living plan uh, to their suppliers and their customers, and even to those of us who uh, bought their products. Um, this, was, this was really considered uh, bold. And they, in addition, they had something very important and that is they had a CEO who was a champion and a driver of the, of the sustainable living plan. And in a company, the CEO is, is uh, paid at what he wants, uh, she wants, uh, receives a lot of attention. Next slide. To give you an example of what was in the sustainable living plan, um, they committed to doubling sales while cutting in half their environmental footprint. Many times companies don't know how they're going to do it, but setting the ambitious goals helps them drive towards it. What sounds um, um, ambitious and vague help 1 billion people improve their health and well being, but they put some teeth behind that and they put some products behind it. Two examples of what they did and also uh, benefited the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of people in their, in their uh, supply chain was products like Lifebuoy and uh, Purit. Um, India is, a, is where they have a big operation. And the, one of the causes of, um, of the deaths of in, from, in children is one of the leading causes is in diarrhea. And that comes from not having the right hygiene and not having safe water. Um, and so what they did was um, they, for the life boy to educate about the importance of washing hands, they, educated the children, the children went home and told their parents about it. And they created a little ditty uh, that the children love to sing about their, um, the importance of that. And then they had little um, musical trucks going through the neighborhood and um, educating the customers. Um, because of the safe water, they created something called Purit, which is basically um, putting local water through a series of filters. And all of this has cut dramatically. They did these projects very often with other nonprofit with nonprofits and with the government, but also with other uh, producers. Uh, next slide. Uh, GE is a huge company. It has 150 products, um, and they're in diesel locomotive and in um, transportation, aviation healthcare uh, and electric power. And so they created something called Ecomagination. And this was to send the message to all of their workers, uh, their scientists, their um, uh, sell, the people who sell them, that this was a portfolio of environmentally superior products and services. The goals of all of these were to cut emissions and increase sales and double investment in research and development. Between 2010 and 2015, they invested 10 billion. They created the Open Innovation Challenge because they knew they didn't have all of the information. They used to spur new ideas and greater collaboration in the wider industry, providing funding for some great but underfunded proposals. Eco-imagination challenge was particularly interesting open source call for updating existing power grids with 21st century technologies. They attracted 70,000 proposals from 150 countries in 10 weeks. So this, uh, this spurred um, in a very real way. Um, 
they incorporated sustainability reporting with financial reporting. And the reason this is important is so sustainability isn't seen as to the side. It's, uh, it, it's part and parcel of the business and it shows how um, the business is going to grow from investing in sustainability. This is becoming best practices among uh, companies that report on their sustainability. Um, this was also CEO led by Jeff Immelt, uh, who was um, a champion in, in much the way that um, Paul Pullman of Unilever uh, was. And finally, we get to Walmart. Next slide. <clears throat> These were their broad sustainability goals, vague with no endpoints, to be supplied 100% by renewable energy, to create zero waste, and to sell products that sustain people and the environment. Next, um, this was, became a framework and, and um, um, an education of their buyers and their suppliers of what was going to be important and what was going to get intention, attention. And, when the buyers and suppliers saw that they could have a better shot at uh, getting a contract, they would they would make sure that included uh, they told about what they were doing um, in sustainability. Um, after they set these broad this broad framework, they set specific, measurable, and public goals. Um, and they were goals that were relevant to uh, Walmart. Um, and to communicate to all of their employees, they referred to this as Sustainability 360, a comprehensive approach, operations, suppliers, customers, communities. And they set requirements for suppliers eventually of things to meet. And they helped educate their suppliers, sharing with them what they had learned in their journey on sustainability. Uh, when they had supplier um, gatherings of thousands of suppliers, um, sustainability had a very key place in that meeting. Um, they even wanted to spur some sustainability practices among their employees. So they had something called the Personal Sustainability Program. And this was meant for them to personally in their lives embrace some of the goals of sustainability eat more healthy foods, uh, exercise more, uh, pay attention to the waste, what you do with the waste in your home and electricity. This also, the key to this was the top leadership and broad business engagement. This was not run by the sustainability team. There were only four of us. And uh, we wanted the business to lead the charge because then they would create the value. Um, and they even went to so far as to incorporate their sustainability goals into the bonus criteria. So you could be a, a, a very uh, model employee, but if you didn't meet your sustainability goals, you might get 15% less of the bonus that you would otherwise. This is making it real. Um, so um, next slide. Um, what is it that they did? Um, that were the best practices in sustainability. The first step is critical. Identify your biggest risks, opportunities, and what we call hotspots. Um, then you focus on the, what we call materiality. And the materiality analysis is reaching out to all your stakeholders, your shareholders, your employees, uh, your suppliers, um, and, and determining which of these are most relevant and which Walmart or uh, Unilever or GE had the most control and was most important um, to, to do. You can't tackle everything at once. So you identify your materiality. Within that framework, you set goals, measurable, stretch, achievable from an appropriate baseline. And then you adopt the policies and reorganize to minimize negative and positive impacts. Um, and the positive is important because there's some things that businesses in the community are uniquely positioned to do. You track those goals transparently, you report on progress or lack thereof publicly. And even to report on what you didn't achieve in your goals is as important so that you can explain that you know why you didn't reach those. Um, and then you reset the goals to increase the impact from experience. 
So with all this going on, can sustainability save capitalism? As you can see, there are many models to replicate, innovations to explore, and many pr best practices to adopt. However, it will be dependent on people like you who have linked your values and passions to your knowledge and who are investing in an education that will enable you to have a significant impact on the field. The good news for you is that many paths can take you there. M varying skills and experiences are important. My path was quite a zigzag from government to nonprofit to business on issues as varied as voting and strategy development and international conflict resolution. Perhaps the strangest turn of all in my career was to go from international conflict resolution to Walmart's first sustainability team. All that I learned in previous positions was of value. The necessary skills to execute a successful sustainability strategy relate to the various roles that you will be required to play. You will be an educator and a translator of what sustainability means to business. You will need to be an advocate for sustainable solutions that may require the way they change doing business. You will be an aggregator because you will work across all the units of the company as many of the issues are interrelated and you may be the only one who sees the connections. You will be a collaborator since what you are trying to achieve may not be in your colleague's job description and you can't do it alone. It goes without saying that you need to know the business and the best practices within the industry, but those are doable if you're a good listener. There are invaluable resources to that. I've mentioned Green Biz and they have a variety of newsletters that cover different sectors. Um, and then the annual sustain sustainability reports of companies. These used to be terrible to read, but they've gotten very interesting now. And they even have become very granular. They orient you to the issues, help you choose a lane, stay current and help identify opportunities as well. Knowledge and expertise are built in layers. Spending some time doing this is an easy way to build the layers of knowledge and soon you will have an expertise to better analyze and critique strategies. So can sustainability save capitalism? You can help answer that. You will have a head start on those who have gone before you because of your education and because the wealth of efforts that are underway. Then perhaps you may ultimately save capitalism. Now I'm happy to take some questions. This is Madhu. Thanks so much for this wonderful talk that you gave. Uh, while people are thinking of their questions, I thought I'd just, um, you know, pick up on what you said you ended with, which is, uh, you know, can uh, effectively, you know, can the good work by uh, some of these large corporations save save uh, capitalism and make it more sustainable? And, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, I think you so sort of an idea that you you uh, were beginning to articulate, but maybe take it a little further in, in terms of what it would take to expand this whole, uh, you know, um, um, sort of um, move towards sustainability by the corporate sector to smaller companies, you know, mid-sized or smaller companies and beyond the giants um, so that it becomes more widespread. All right, sorry, I, I did hear uh, Professor Khanna's uh, question about how the, is it only the giants that can play in this? And no, it's uh, uh, many of these small and medium sized businesses are uh, uh, suppliers to these big giants, but they also attend the same meetings and there are um, enormous number of meetings that would um, enable um, them to learn. and. Um, many of the nonprofits are doing uh, uh, tutorials and uh, meetings, um, their annual meetings every year. Uh, Green Biz has all sorts of events of which you see a variety of people there. Um, and there's no end of people who want to share their stories. And the competitive nature uh, of this business is that people want to learn and they want to show off. And then you have uh, when we went to the sustainability um, annual summit that the Food Marketing Institute did, um, we had many um, uh, people from companies who came to learn. So uh, it's a good 
it's a good thing to keep attention on and it's an opportunity for uh, educators as well to share the, the stories. Thank you, Dr. Henches. I had a, a quick question. So uh, with when you're working with sustainability teams, what do you think are some of their biggest uh, challenges currently with either identifying problems or implementing them? Where, where do you feel that they're getting blocked in their processes of going to a more sustainable solution within their business? Yeah, th that is also a good question because uh, what you're competing with is time and attention in a company. So you might have somebody who's an advocate of sustainability and they want to do it, but the, they are so stretched so thin, they have deadlines, they have numbers they have to meet. And so this is where you have to find a way to um, understand what their challenges are and to help them solve the problems. Um, they're, um, what successful CEOs do is um, use their pulpit um, at general meetings to um, talk about the um, successes. Uh, one of the things that Walmart did was uh, we had uh, Saturday meetings, but we also had quarterly meetings just on sustainability. And buyers would get up and they'd say, this is the sustainability challenge that I had. Um, this is how I solved it, and this is how it's good for the business, and this is the result of the sales. One of the examples I remember was um, a child's um, uh, sco uh, uh, scooter, um, uh, or, I'm sorry, or a seat, and it was such that they needed a big box to put it in, and they found that those big boxes were a convenient way for people to put little things that they wanted to buy but didn't want to pay for, so they for lots of reasons, they wanted to be able to send these um, uh, car seats in a more sustainable way. So they worked with um, a number of people and they refigured the seat. They worked with the supplier so that they could uh, nest inside each other. That made for a much smaller um, um, package to be shipped. And there wasn't much room to put little items that we, as they call, um, it's, it's um, they have a name for it, it's escaping me right now. But um, at any rate, they, they was, there's a loss every year from those things that um, didn't sell, either because they were damaged or because um, they were stolen. And so um, those figures started to go down and that spurred other people in the company to, because here they had the CEO introducing them and saying, what did you do? And they're telling you what they did for sustainability and for the business. And that's in no, very, very uh, powerful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, so obviously there are some things that will definitely save the company money as you're talking about but then there are some other uh, strategies or solutions that I'm thinking of, like maybe material sourcing currently that might increase costs for the company. How are companies currently measuring the increasing customer demand from things that are costing the company money upfront? And how are they showing that to C-suite to be like, this will actually increase sales if we right. spend that money? Well, the whole, whole story of the product has to be looked at. And so um, they might say, well, this is a more sustainable material to use in the design of this product, um, but it will, um, it'll be worth it because uh, we'll do more sales because it'll appeal to a certain um, uh, category of buyer. Um, so they have to understand the return on the investment in the sustainability. Um, they have to see it. And what happened is they were using a variety of, of measurements. If they were, if it was something that was going to allow them to sell to a new category of buyers, people who were more interested in bamboo because it was a renewable source um, or who um, liked the material that was going to be more durable. So you have to look at all of those and make the decisions. Um, Another example from Walmart is when they went to concentrated detergent and um, they, uh, they the, the packages were smaller, they used less, less uh, uh, plastic. Uh, but then the, the suppliers said, but we're gonna get less shelf life, shelf space. And they want 
the shelf space. So when somebody comes through, you can see um, all or uh, your competitors. And so the CEO of Walmart said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you sell as much. You can have more as you equal to the space that you had before, which meant they had more product on the shelves. So there were lots of ways to, and, and this was what was fun about it, that once it got into the buyers, they felt they could be innovative and, and change the trajectory. Uh, uh, Unilever invested in all sorts of programs and advertising to uh, sell the solution of soap. And much of this was not um, by Lifebuoy, but their sales did go up, but so did others. Dr. Henches, about um, it's related to John's question about consumers and uh, thinking about consumer pressure and, and businesses and their responsiveness to consumer pressure. How much do you see the culture change in corporate America as being driven by a kind of sea change in, in consumer in consumer priorities? Yes. Uh, for a long time, it didn't translate into sales. People said, I, when they would, were asked uh, by a surveyor, um, would you buy a um, detergent that did this or that? And they'd say, oh yes, but then they actually did not go and do it, particularly if the price was different. But I think they're beginning to see a change in that. Uh, there's an aura that companies want to have that they're doing good business and that they, um, particularly among millennials and Gen Z, um, you know, they're indexing very high on matching their values with um, what they buy. Um, but yeah, it's a constant struggle and you struggle with the marketing department in your company um, to uh, balance those things. Uh, and at shareholders meetings, this has to be um, at once. Uh, someone told me that at one of the Walmart meetings, they said, so a shareholder got up and said, I really don't like all this money you're spending on sustainability. And um, supposedly the current CEO said, maybe you better invest somewhere else. <laughs> that isn't said very often by a CEO to an investor, but, but uh, the present CEO of Walmart is really committed. 